Good morning. Welcome to St. John Hill Church. My name is Dave Bittler. I am the pastor here. If you're visiting with us this morning, we wish you a special welcome and thank you for worshiping with us today. Uh, just a few announcements before uh, we begin. A um, lot of things uh, are happening or will soon be happening. Um, there will be a congregational meeting on May 7th. Um, and the, uh, the items uh, to be discussed are in your bulletin. Please take a look at that, and if you're a member, please plan on staying. Uh, that would be two Sundays from now, uh, so that we can move forward uh, on these uh, projects. Um, Tuesday nights, we're, uh, we are um, studying the book uh, Tattoos, Telling the Secrets of the Soul. would love to have you join us. If you do not have a copy of the book yet and would like one to join us, uh, let me know uh, after worship today, and we'll make sure that you get one. Uh, that study runs from 6 until 8, uh, and it will be running for uh, roughly about six weeks. Uh, VBS is coming up, and if you would like to help uh, donate um, uh, supplies, there's a list of things on the uh, door in the narthex. Uh, on that side. Uh, also, if you would like to uh, sign up to help volunteer uh, on any of the days, um, there's also information out there uh, that will help you with that. Um, ham supper posters are available, which also means that the ham supper is coming up. And so uh, if you've been here any time at all, you know how much uh, help and work goes into that. So if uh, you're available to help uh, with those things, that's greatly appreciated as well. But if you can take a hat, Hang up some posters around town, that would help as well. Also, uh, Mission Trip Birdsboro is coming up in July, and the um, sign-up for volunteers uh, is now open. And when we say volunteers, we're talking about not just people who can work on the sites, but people who can help in the kitchen, uh, people who can help uh, photography, material distribution, um, spiritual development. Um, there is something for you to do. Uh, they even find stuff for me to do, so that lets you know the, the low bar that it takes to, uh, to be uh, useful on this project. But it's a great time, and I hope you'll consider uh, helping out this year. Anything I'm forgetting? Well, at this time, let's uh, take a few moments as we prepare our hearts for worship as we hear the praises.
church. Would you stand for our call to worship? There's a lesson in there about changing batteries. Um, that's probably a sermon for another time. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Would you join with me in our opening hymn, it's number 111 in your brown hymn book, or the words will be on the wall behind me. Grace greater than all our sin. <coughs> Almighty God, we thank you for the grace of Jesus Christ that comes to us through his death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave. Father, we come this morning seeking your grace, grace that covers our sin, and grace that causes us to praise you for who you are and what you have done. O Lord, may the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. 
We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to a time where we confess our sins before the Lord, I would ask that you take your bulletin or follow on the wall behind me. We will pray together in unison the prayer of confession. Following that time, we'll take a few moments in silent prayer to confess our own personal sins to the Lord. I'll then close this in prayer and offer us some words of assurance. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves, even within our sorrow for the wrong we have done and the good we have left undone. Lord, you are full of compassion and grace, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. There is always forgiveness with you. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Bind up that which is broken. Give light to our minds, strength to our wills, and rest to our souls. Speak to each of us, and let your word abide with us until it has brought in us your holy will. Amen. Let's take a few moments in silent confession this morning. God of all grace, as we come before you this morning to confess our sins, to plead the merit of Jesus' blood, Lord, would you hear our prayer? Forgive us and cleanse us, wash us and renew us, that we may walk in the joy of your grace. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Hear these words. From Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's sing together the doxology. We'll continue with our worship as we take up our morning's tithes and offerings. I'll ask our ushers to please come forward.
Lord of all good things. We thank you for the good gifts that we have that come from you. We are mindful of all the blessings that you give us each day, that they renew each morning. Father, would you accept these gifts from our hand? Bless each one and bless each giver to the work of your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you remain standing as we continue to sing? <coughs> that time again there's very few things that make me happier than today I, um, just want to express a couple of words uh, as a reminder for what we are about to do um, not all churches baptize infants uh, we do because we believe that our faith is a covenantal faith. And what we are about to do is recognize something that is already true. Is that children born to Christian parents are part of the Christian household of faith. And so just as when Morgan was born, I'm assuming you gave her the name Weller, right? You didn't wait and ask her if that was okay, right? Uh, 
being born to Christian parents, she's also born into the family of Jesus Christ. And so when we baptize people, we, this is a naming ceremony, welcoming her into the family of God. This is not conveying salvation. It's just recognizing the family that she belongs to. So with that, I'm going to invite Megan and Keith and Morgan to come up and join me up here. I'm going to have you guys stand over here. Baptism is a celebration that conveys several layers of meaning. It is at once a sign of the washing away of sin, a sign of our union with Jesus' death and resurrection, a sign of the promise of new birth in Christ, a sign of incorporation in the church, a sign of the promise of the Holy Spirit, and a sign of the covenant of the kingdom of God. Keith and Megan, as you have brought your child for baptism, I now charge you with the following confession and questions. Do you acknowledge your child's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of his Holy Spirit? So please say we do. Do you claim God's covenant promise on Morgan's behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for her salvation as you do for your own? If so, please say we do. Do you now unreservedly dedicate your child to God and promise in humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before her a godly example, that you will pray with and for her, that you will teach her the doctrines of our holy faith, that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring her up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? If so, please say we do. All right. Keith and Megan, since you have confessed Jesus Christ is Lord, and acknowledge that he alone is your salvation. And since it is your desire to bring up Morgan in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, you now bring her to be baptized as a covenantal sign, and in earnest of your desire that at the proper age she will confess Christ as Savior, having received the washing of regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Our Father, we praise and thank you for your covenant promises to your people. Thank you for the birth of this precious child and her inclusion in your family, the church. We beseech you to bless this child with the grace promised and sealed in these waters of baptism, that she may never know a day in which she does not know you as Lord and Savior. May this child love and trust you as the only one who can wash away her sins, as signed and pledged in her baptism. May the Holy Spirit work through the promises of this sacrament, implanting and nurturing faith in the heart of this dear little one. Please protect this child from evil and from the schemes of the devil. We entrust this child to the care of her great shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I would ask the congregation to please stand because I also have a question for you. Do you, the people of the Lord, promise to receive this child in love and pray for her, help instruct her in the faith, and encourage and sustain her in the fellowship of believers? If so, please say, we do. We do. You may be seated. How's this going to go, right? We're going to do this okay? We'll see. Oops. I'm going to get you this way so everybody can see you. Why don't you just pray? Yeah. This is going to be fun, isn't it? All right. Keith, what is the full name of this child? Morgan Eileen Weller. Morgan Eileen Weller. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this dear little one. We thank you that she has been included in your family and that you know her by name. Would you bless her and her parents and her whole family that she will always know you as her Lord and Savior. 
We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, you found something to pull on, didn't you? Yeah. All right. Can we go for a little walk? All right. Okay. Come here, little one. Let's, let's take a walk. See, all these people over here, you know them, right? Okay. You, you don't get any choice. Okay. They're, they're what you're stuck with. All right. But a lot of these rest of these folks, they're the crazy ones that you just, you'll get to know and love like I do. So, we're just going to take a walk and say hello. See? Your family just got a whole lot bigger. That's all we can say. Right? And say hi to everybody, and then we'll even go up to the peanut gallery and see how they're doing. <laughs> right? And you can get a good view. This is what it looks like from up here. And there's even crazy people who live up here too, who will love you all your days. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go. You are so good. You're handling like this. You're like, you know what we're doing. Good. Look at that. All right, we'll take you back to mommy now. All right, there you go. She did so good. And then we have a baptism certificate for you guys. All right, so that's in there. And my favorite, the Jesus Storybook Bible. So there you go. Congratulations. You see? And yes, you can clap. <laughs> it's over there, okay. I was like, I know I had it. All right. If you have your Bibles, now that I've found mine, and would like to follow along, we're in Matthew chapter 7. We'll be reading verses 15 through 23. Let us hear the word of God. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. May God have his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Let's pray. Almighty God, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, we come to sit at your feet to hear your word Father, by your spirit, would you, again, be our teacher to guide us, direct us, to know your truth, to lead us into everlasting life. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.
Anybody here have a sign on their house, on their property, that says, beware of dogs? Anybody? Anybody? Nobody has? Do you actually have a dog? Okay. Because <laughs> it would be kind of incredulous, it would be kind of silly to put up a sign that says, beware of dog, if in fact you don't have a dog unless you're, you know, intentionally trying to mislead someone, okay? If you say, beware of, you know, we've got two, so if you don't like to be licked, don't come to our house, because I can't control the one. Uh, she just, her tongue's going all the time. Uh, you don't tell somebody to beware of something that isn't there, right? And so when Jesus tells us, beware of false prophets, then we should assume that they exist, that they are in the world, that they are something to watch out for. Jesus wouldn't say, hey, watch out for this if it didn't exist. Right? We wouldn't warn people about something that's not there. So what is this warning that he's giving us? Now, if you remember, if you've been here, We've been talking about in chapter 7 of the Sermon on the Mount, the key theme here is judgment. And we know that in our culture today, the word judgment has a very bad connotation. And most of that comes from people reading verse 1 of chapter 7 and then nothing else. Because we read, you know, judge not that ye be not judged, and then we think that's all that Jesus said on the matter. Well, he did say that, but what he's talking about is judgment that is essentially condemnation. But then in the rest of the chapter, he's telling us how to pursue and act with good judgment. Last week we looked at you know, verses 13 and 14, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Well, how are you going to tell which gate is narrow and which gate is wide if you're not judging it from the beginning? You have to look at every situation and make a judgment. And Jesus is saying that the judgment that you make needs to be focused on not necessarily the gate, but the destination that the gate leads to. Our decisions that we, we make every day should not be informed by how is this going to make me feel today, how is this going to affect me right now, it is what destination, what road is this going to put me on? What path am I taking? Am I following the narrow path that Jesus says leads to life? The destination is important. Or am I on the wide path? Right? And Jesus is basically saying, if you're following the crowd, if everybody's going in that direction, you're probably on the wrong path. Because the world is going to seek its own pleasure. But Jesus says, as Christians, as followers of Christ, we seek the pleasure and the will of God. And so we have this dichotomy. There's the narrow gate, there's the wide gate. There's the narrow path, there's the wide path. And then Jesus says, there is also another dichotomy that you have to be ready for. There are false prophets, and there are true prophets prophets. And he says, be careful who you allow to teach you. Now, this is a difficult sermon for someone like me to preach because it's going to sound like I'm going to say, hey, look at me. If you walk away hearing me say that, please smack me on the way out the door because that is not what I'm intending to say at all. Okay? And if I ever get close to that, please let me know, because that's not what I want you to hear. In fact, that's actually the definition that Jesus is giving us 
of a false prophet. And as I told you last week, I said almost three years ago, this congregation became very judgmental. Because I showed up and I preached, and then they said, go away, and we're going to talk about you. And we're going to vote. All right? And as I recall, nobody said no. So you all made what I think we've agreed on now is good judgment. <laughs> now, if at the next consistory meeting people start asking me to leave, then I'm going to wonder uh, which one of us made the mistake. I don't foresee that happening, so thank you. Um, but that was an example of examining a prophet. Now, a prophet is just one who speaks truth, speaks the word of God, which is what you call me here to do. Now, I'm not receiving words from God that are new. I'm just taking what he's already said and telling you what he said. Okay, that's my job. My job is not to tell you anything new. It's to say, oh, the Lord told me this morning. Well, if he told me anything this morning that's already in here, then he didn't need to tell me this morning because he already said it. If he told me something this morning that's not in here, and I say that to you, that he told me something this morning that's not in here, that's when you need to kick me out the door. Because at that point, I've become a false prophet. And notice what he says False prophets come to you in sheep's clothing. They come all gentle and, you know, nice and, and cuddly. He said, but inside they are ravenous wolves. Now again, remember what we said at the beginning. These people exist. They are out there. Many of them are on television. I will said this once, I'll say it a hundred times. If somebody's on television, they're making money for somebody. And it's usually themselves. I don't know if you all remember Ray Stevens from the 70s and 80s. Wrote a great song back then, said, Would Jesus wear a Rolex on his television show? I mean, he was talking about this exact problem. All right? Now, I'm not saying that people are not don't deserve to be paid. I enjoy getting my paycheck. Thank you. Appreciate it. You know, it helps my family keep going. But Jesus says, look at the fruit that they produce. Right? So, absolutely yes, you should judge those who seek to teach. Which means, yes, you get to judge me every week. And I thank you for keep coming back. Because hopefully it tells me that I'm doing a good job. Okay? But Jesus is saying, be picky. Be particular about who you allow to teach you. Look at the fruit of their life. Look at the fruit of those that they teach. Basically, it comes down to this. Does the teacher cause you to want to glorify God, or are you tempted to glorify them? Are they seeking God's glory, or are they seeking a bigger platform, a higher platform from which to promote themselves? And let me just be perfectly honest with you. I don't care who you are in a position like mine, that temptation is real. Because pretty much every pastor will stand in the back, and I'll be honest with you, when people come through and say, hey, that was a great sermon today, thank you for that. Boy, it's real easy to start puffing that chest out a little bit and going, boy, that was pretty good, wasn't it? That's why, because most of us in my position, we are affirmation junkies, right? You know, some people, you know, shoot up with drugs, you know, they shoot up with alcohol. That's what, what fuels them. For pastors, it's affirmation. 
when you tell them, hey, you're doing a great job. And they're like, oh, come on, come on, tell me some more, tell me some more. Right? We've got a hole in that affirmation cup, and it just, it leaks out as fast as it comes in. And for many of us, it becomes a drug. And we seek that. And so people will start saying what you want to hear so that you'll keep telling us how good we are. My job is to not care about that. My job is not to care about what you want to hear, but to tell you the truth, even if it's uncomfortable. And so that's why I usually give a warning when I know I'm going to be stepping on toes, I tell people, okay, lift your feet up, because I'm going to be stomping today. And, if you, and the reason why I know that is because as I've been studying the word through the week, it's been stomping on my toes. So I figure if it's been stomping on mine, it's probably going to stomp on yours too. And some of these words of Jesus get really scary. Because he says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in to the fire, thus you will recognize them by their fruits. And then he goes on. Remember, the little you know, paragraph headings are not part of the original text. They're not divinely inspired. And so most of your Bibles will have a, a paragraph heading that looks like it's setting off verses 21 to 23 from what came before it. It's not. Jesus is continuing the thought, and he's talking about those false prophets. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. See, in, in Hebrew speech and grammar, if something is repeated, Lord, Lord, that is an indication of a perceived um, emotional connection. There is an intimacy there. And so someone is coming to, you know, you know the, the picture is, you know, this false prophet who's been thinking that they've been uh, promoting God's glory when they're promoting their own, come to say, well, Lord, Lord, we have this connection. We're good, right? Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He's still talking about these ravenous wolves that are all, might come to you all nice and cuddly, but are looking to devour your soul for the fulfillment of theirs. And I will tell you, my earnest desire for you is to see you glorify Christ to glorify Jesus in all that you do. Whether anybody ever says to me again, good sermon, Pastor, I could care less. But if you walk out the door and say, I love Jesus today more than I loved him yesterday, and I'm going to serve him better today than I did yesterday, that fills my heart. And that is what fills the heart of a true prophet. It's one who does not seek his own glory, but seeks the glory of Christ. Because Jesus goes on to say, on that day, many people will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Hey, I was a great preacher, God. You know, Jesus, I, I gave great sermons for you. I cast out demons. I did mighty works in your name. You've seen it on TV. There's preachers who start winging, take off their suit coat and start winging it around and people start falling over. That ain't in here. That's a show to say, send me some more money. Look at how we're blessing people. That's a show. And if you're flipping through the channels and you see that, please keep right on going. And Jesus will, he says, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. See, at the end of the day, it's not about how much I profess that I know Jesus. It's does he know me? Has he claimed me as his own? 
And if he has claimed me as his own, then I know I will seek his glory in all things. Because even God has exalted Christ to the highest place. That's what his death and resurrection earned for him. That is why he went through Good Friday. That's why he was raised to the right hand of the Father. Because God had promised that this will be your inheritance, and your inheritance comes from exactly what we did this morning. Why did Jesus do what he did? Because he said, God is preparing a people that I will take unto myself, those who are called into my name. And so that's why it is important for us, important for you, to keep me in check, to examine the word and say, Pastor, is that really what that says? Because I'm trying to do the same thing for you. I'm looking at the Word telling you this is how as Christians we live in the kingdom of God. That we make sure that we are making good judgments, wise judgments to the glory of God that we are staying on the straight and narrow. I don't know why we call it straight and narrow because I'm pretty sure it's pretty curvy. And there's rocks and there's boulders and the way is hard. It's narrow. But that's what Jesus calls us to. If you feel like life is going easy, take a minute and reevaluate. Because making godly choices is hard. Making godly choices using godly wisdom in this world will cost you something. If you're not paying a price, chances are you've moved into the wide gate and are just going with the flow. Now, at the same time, don't go out and look for your own persecution. Just so that you can say, oh, look, everybody's persecuting me. I'm a... Well, if you're seeking it out on purpose, it doesn't count. That's, just, that's not exercising godly wisdom. That's just adopting a persecution complex so that you can show people how holy you are. That doesn't work either. Jesus is saying, this is not easy but it's worth it. It's a way that leads to life. And folks, for me to do my job, I'm pushing real hard to keep us all on the path that leads to life. And say, hey, let's get out of the, get out of the wide lane. Let's get back over here into the narrow lane. Because it's easy to drift. It's easy for me to drift. It's easy for you to drift. The reason we are a body of believers is to help each other and saying, hey, let's maybe it's lean back over this way. That's the loving thing to do. That's what Christ calls us to do to help each other, is to realize that there are wolves out there that would love to eat you for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. to fatten their own bellies, to fatten their own egos, to raise their own platforms, instead of seeking the glory of Christ. It's Christ who did the work for us to earn a a salvation that we could have solely on the basis of his grace. He has earned that glory. And he has shown us the way to go and given us the guidelines and the pathway to get there. Let us follow it together for his glory. Amen. In response to God's word, Would you join me as we affirm our faith together by reciting the Apostles' Creed? The words are in your bulletin and also on the wall behind me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 
and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we come to a time of prayer this morning, I would well, let's take these and any unspoken requests that you may have to the Lord in prayer this morning. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, we thank you for the words of Jesus and the warnings that he gives us, the encouragement that we need to seek out good and right paths using the wisdom provided by your spirit and your word. Father, would you help us as we seek to walk in your truth and your ways. Father, let us not be led astray by those who would seek their own glory. Father, let us live and strive for the glory of Jesus Christ. And Father, for his glory, we have lifted up many requests and praises before you this morning. Father, would you receive those to yourself? And Father, by your Spirit, would you work and act to bring all things in accordance with your will? Father, for those things that we have not spoken out loud, but Lord, you know, remain particularly heavy on our hearts this morning, Lord, we give those to you as well. Seeking your grace and your peace. Guide us, Lord, in all things. We ask this in Jesus' name, who taught his disciples and so us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand for our closing hymn? It's number 906 in your brown hymnal, and the words will be on the wall behind me. Room at the cross for you.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. God be with you.